Okay, good evening and welcome to the Board of Trustees meeting. Please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join in a moment of silence for our fallen servicemen and women. All right, so we're going to begin our meeting again with a new feature you may or may not be familiar with, and it's called Quick Resident Comments. And it is for residents who are unable to stay for the whole meeting, but came and wanted to say something um, a minute maximum. Uh, if anyone is either on Zoom or in the room who cannot stay for the whole meeting, but would like to come to the podium and uh, make a quick statement or a quick comment, you're welcome to do that now. Anyone in the room? Anyone on Zoom? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, we'll move now to um, the board approval, and I'll turn it over to Chief Pern of the Volunteer Firefighters. Thank you, Mayor. So we have six new members for approval tonight, and I'd just like to read a quick bio on each of them. Isabel Burns is a graduating senior at the Garden City High School and will be attending Bucknell University in the fall. She currently works at the Garden City Public Library, volunteers on the Environmental Advisory Board, and is a member of the American Legion Auxiliary. Isabel has been a member of the Junior Firefighter Program in Garden City since 2019 and is very thankful and excited to have the opportunity to join the department and serve her community. We have a bit to go. Raymond Burns is a graduating senior at Garden City High School and will be attending the University of Pennsylvania in the fall. He currently works at the Garden City Public Library, volunteers at the Bird Sanctuary, and represents the community as a student ambassador on the Environmental Advisory Board. A member of the Junior Firefighters Program in the Garden City Fire Department since 2020, Raymond is, is enthusiastic to continue his involvement in the fire service and serve his community in a new and exciting way. Lorraine Gouchard is a graduate of St. John's University, where she received her master's in education. She's currently employed as a New York City school teacher. Joining the Garden City Fire Department will give her the privilege to learn valuable skills that will apply to all emergency situations. She's also looking to give back to her community during the, their toughest days. Jack Levi is graduating Garden City High School. He's planning to attend SUNY Cortland in the fall. He's excited to be able to work with the Garden City Fire Department and con uh, contribute to his community. Cody Wareham is going to be attending Nassau Community College in the fall. He currently works as an EMTB for a town of Hempstead EMS. Prior to joining that, uh, Cody ser has served a little more of a year as a Mineola Volunteer Ambulance Corps member. He's excited to continue to serve his community in the fire service. Mackenzie Wareham is a graduate of the Garden City High School who will be attending St. Aslam College to play collegiate field hockey. Through the three years as a junior firefighter, she became captain of the Garden City Junior Firefighters in her final year. Mackenzie, as well as selected to participate in the Fahrenheit 516 camp where she received the honor of being the captain for her firefighting squad. She's thrilled to become a volunteer firefighter for her community, just like her father was, and will uh, work diligently to do her best for the department. And that is all six of them. Thank you. So do we have a motion for board approval of the volunteer firefighters? I'll make that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And I just want to say, you know, on behalf of the board, thank you so much for this service. Volunteerism is um, so important and there's no more impactful volunteer service in our village than the volunteer firefighters. So thank you for what you're doing.
Okay. So we'll move to comments from department heads. We'll begin with Mr. Baroni. Good evening, Mayor, members of uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, DPW has seven items on the agenda this evening. I'd like to direct everybody's attention on the Public Works. Item 10 is a request to extend the agreement with DAK Services of NY. This is a consultant who has been helping to fill the gap to operate and manage the village water system. We are actively working on hiring and training internal staff to re rely less on the consultant services. DAK Services has also been part of the ongoing treatment updates and assisting with coordination of startups of our wells. Item number 11 is a request to engage Eagle Control Corp for additional maintenance and support for the water SCADA systems and well, and well controls. This system is critical to the operation of the water treatment and distribution to monitor pumps, tank levels, pressures, chemical residuals, and required alarm controls. Item number 12 is a request to approve the rates for water testing services with PACE Analytical. PACE is a certified EPA lab who analyzes all of the required water samples throughout the year. Testing of the drinking water and groundwater is required by Nassau County and New York State Health Departments. Item number 13 is a request to renew the water equipment maintenance contract with Hack Inc. in the amount of $45,707. HAC provides maintenance and support for all chemical analyzers and pH probes in the water system. HAC will calibrate, monitor, and respond to emergencies when the equipment needs adjustments. The equipment they prov provide is proprietary, excuse me, and only HAC can work on it. Item number 14 is a request to declare an emergency and to engage Banker Construction Corp to repair a fire hydrant, which as a result of a leak is out of service, and risks the ability to provide adequate fire protection to several large buildings that include the Nassau County office buildings. The cost of the repair is $63,810. I'd like to direct your attention on the award of bids. Item number 15 is a request to renew a contract with Vigliotti Recycling Corp for the disposal of grass, leaves, brush, and yard waste. This contract is mostly util is utilized on an as-needed basis and is used to remove all the leaves that are collected during leaf season. It is also occasionally used throughout the year as debris is, accum as debris is accumulated within the yard. Item number 16 is a request to reject the bid from Sierra Contracting Corp, who was a sole bidder, as they do not meet specifications, and to approve the proposal submitted by JT Landscaping, Masonry Landscaping, to demolish the existing fountain and install a new fountain at a cost of $99,500, uh, this is for the fountain located on Stewart Avenue and Franklin Avenue on the northwest corner. Uh, the project was posted twice on the New York State Contract Reporter website, uh, which can be uh, viewed nationwide by anyone with an account. We have also reached out to local vendors. Um, I had uh, conversed with Mr. Fishberg, and he confirmed that we made a reasonable attempt to bid this project per New York State guidelines. Uh, the low bidder was 90000 and the approved budget was 110,000. Uh, the proposal we received is for 99,500. So we are still within budget. Um, that's all the items the EPW has on the agenda this evening. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any trustee questions? Okay, thank you. And Mr. Giovanelli. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees. The building department does not have anything on the formal agenda this evening, but I'd just like to give the board um, an update for the um, performance of the building department for June. Um, the building department has taken in and reviewed 177 applications, has performed 193 uh, building inspections, and has taken in a fee of $137,200 for the month of June to date. That's all I have this evening. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? I, I guess the only question I have is I know at the last board when we talked about H2M and I saw your email today about the years. Uh, is it just a question about how many years worth of data we're looking for? I didn't know. I was at those meetings. So I, I asked for data back in 2017. I asked for a table for me. The mic. Not knowing specifically what you're looking for, I went back um, to 2017 because mm -hmm. that's kind of when the AOP started. Uh, okay. 
Uh, just, everything's fine. We're just what we're, we're just looking for, Ralph. Was and again, apologies, you missed the last meeting, but the question that came up was is that we do have a very large relationship with H two M. I think it would be good to understand kind of the breadth and the depth of it. And I think one of the points that came up that Trustee Torino raised, uh, like myself, was is that at times you know we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we are becoming too dependent on an outside vendor that we might be able to sole source internally and actually be able to build more kind of institutional expertise in the space. So that's really the question is to understand the breadth and the depth and then look to see if there's any opportunities for us to possibly bring in people in-house that could actually be able to do it in a much more cost-effective manner. Okay, so um, so what I've done is there's a lot of data because they store it one way, we store it another way, and there were, there were supplemental increases as projects went on. But I can tell you, I, I did graph the dollars that uh, I did initial graph, and it, it goes like this and it spikes because of the water tank uh, and the uh, AOP. AOP was like $7 million worth of expenses. Uh, but there's also uh, the subtleties in that because some of the emergency stuff in the beginning, when we had to really start doing stuff, they were paying other contractors. We were paying other contractors through them. So about like a million dollars isn't really their expense, it belongs to other places. So I'm trying to give you an intelligent representation so we know you know, what we're trying to uh, examine here. Yeah, I mean, the, the ask is to have it, <clears throat> the ask is to have an intelligent representation, number one. Number two is to, is to give us some clarity on the relationship, right? Because to me, when we start, I mean, because we had this happen in my line of work, when you start dealing with contractors and then they have subcontractors, things start to get a little bit murky. And I think for us, we want to make sure we have clarity around where it all is. Because I think as we cited before, there was one situation I forgot off the top of my head where it seemed to me, and I think it seemed to you as well, that it might make better sense for us to have that sort of an individual on staff to do the work. And that might be something that we can use over and over again, okay, rather than have to engage these guys. So I think that would be good if we can have it for the next meeting and we can discuss it then. Thank you. Now it's on. It's on. Uh, we're looking for information so that we can determine the tipping point between using outside services and inside services. Right. Um, the military has a protocol in which they can expand and contract depending on the conflicts that they have to engage. We as a village are having a repeated situation where we are going outside versus utilizing the services of a staff employee. So part of the concept that we are looking for is what is the level of expertise that we need? What is the bell curve that we normally use on an annual or lifetime use? Um, so for instance, if you have a baseball team, you don't wanna have just nine players on your roster. You need to have just a little bit more room. And are we as a village running too lean and not having enough and therefore incurring the cost for outside services, which may in fact be at a premium? I don't know, but if you can answer that, that would be great. So just, just quickly to dive into it a bit, uh, no pun related to water diving in. Um, the um, When the AOP process emerging contaminant came to light, uh, usually in the in the normal trajectory of water suppliers, when an emerging contaminant is coming on the radar screen, the health department usually gives you like a year and a half to two years time frame to, to uh, put this in place, the, uh, the, uh, the treatment. With this dioxane, they didn't afford us that at all. If it wasn't for COVID hitting, um, which delayed the public hearings, we would have been out of compliance very early on, as with everybody else in the state. Um, but nonetheless, we are in full compliance. Uh, that was reported last night at the AB meeting by uh, Mr. Carey, who attended, our water superintendent. Um, nonetheless, we had to do everything quickly. Uh, associated with the AOP treatments were pilots, so we had to do everything twice. There were grants that, uh, that they filled out for us. Uh, we, we only had two people operating the water department, plus our DAK, the DAK consultant, and we had a, a retired employee. We had four people. So we had to even have them do sampling, which is low-hanging fruit, which is something that we should be doing in-house. A large majority of the work they do, and I haven't finished my analysis, is specialty work. Uh, to hold on to an engineer with that level of skill 
they would make more than more money than we could pay them in the private sector. But there, we want to look for the opportunities. So the opportunity now is to identify all the work because there was so much of it. I have 159 light items, uh, and uh, go with, through with Mr. Carey, Mr. Brony, and see what we can bring in house or what we can teach in house. If we don't have the skill, can we train it? Because water, water has become like you have to be a chemist these days, uh, and the and the the language you speak to the health department with and the acronyms and uh, there's so much science behind it that it's really is a specialty. So I hope the opportunities are there. If I can find them, I'll bring them to you. Because the idea is to save money where we can. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Givanelli? Thank you. All right, Mr. Blake. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, recreation has four items on the agenda this evening. Starting with number six, purchase of an all tech free truck. Uh, board authorization is re requested. It's much more better. Requested to approve the purchase of an LR856 truck from Alltech Industries at a cost of $208,713. This item was budgeted at $215,000. And we are placing that order now because we are told it is a 20 to 24 month wait for the truck. Uh, our existing truck is a 2009 model. It had to undergo about $19,000 worth of repairs to the lift system last year. And we're told by our mechanics at the shop that it's got a lot of hours on the clock and we should be preparing for its replacement. And that's what this is for this evening. Item number seven, purchase of a brush band at wood chipper. We currently have two wood chippers in our department. One was purchased last year. One is at the end of its life and we need to replace it. This new wood chipper will also go in tandem with the new truck when it arrives. Uh, this is being purchased from Malvisi Equipment Company in Hicksville at a cost of $47,612.50. And this item, as the truck is off of a source well contract, which means that the item has already been out to public bid, we have received the best price possible, and that's what it is. Uh, this item was uh, budgeted at $49,000, so we're a little bit under on this one as well. Finally, we have uh, number eight, purchase of a snow mover multi-use tractor. This is a Ventrac tractor. We purchased one of these last year and they work phenomenally well. It is a multi-use tractor. It can do everything from cutting grass to plowing snow and trimming hedges. Uh, this purchase will be made from store tractor at a cost of $65,637.82. This includes the boom cutting attachment and the brush attachment. And this is being purchased off a New York state contract, which again has already been publicly bid. So we know this is a, a good price. All three of these items are from recreation capital budget account. Finally, number nine, the New York state all. The obstacles and I expect to get in touch with him tomorrow to arrange for payments. We need to speak with Treasurer Wu about that. And we are still hopeful that it will be done this summer. Any feedback on the first week with the pool? First week of the pool. Uh, very, very good opening weekend. Uh, pool was in great shape Saturday morning. Uh, kids did a fantastic job down there and our, our rec maintenance crew did a good job with some last minute repairs. Uh, when you shut a pool down for the winter, it can be in perfect condition. And when you go to open it up in the spring, you find little things have developed due to exposure to the weather. Things that are normally kept wet all the time don't typically do well when you let them dry out. And we had a couple of those pop up. We also had some great help from uh, Mr. Baroni and the DPW staff who went to work up at the snack bar area, and grinded down some con concrete that was rather uneven grinded it smooth and they applied a nice layer of a, I think it was a Sherwin-Williams product that tied everything together, smoothed it all out and made it look terrific. 
Uh, in terms of uh, attendance, we were moderately crowded on Saturday. We had a really nice crowd on Sunday afternoon. And the rest of the week has been on and off because the weather has not been great. Uh, we are on target with our revenue projections. And if we can get some nice hot weather, we might actually beat them. Thank you. Mr. Blake, with regard to six, seven, and eight, um, is there a lead time for the equipment being delivered up on site? Uh, again, the lead time for the tree truck is uh, 20 to 24 months. However, we are in touch with all tech industries that they have a large network of fleet stores throughout the country. And we've asked them to see if they could search their inventory and see if there's a truck that meets our specifications that may have been ordered but not purchased by another entity. If that's the case, we might be able to save some time, but that, that's gonna be the long, the long one. The other two items, the, uh, the snow mover is probably a uh, six to eight week delivery. And I would think the brush chipper is probably eight to 10 weeks delivery. That's what it was last year. How are we on staffing at the pool? We're terrific. Full staff? Full staff, more than full staff. Great. We have actually a couple of extra lifeguards, and we just had another young lady come in yesterday and applied for a job. Uh, again, the biggest plus, the biggest positive that we have this year, as we've mentioned, is the public schools are not going back until after Labor Day, and that's really going to help us out. But that's what really hurt us the last two years. Schools starting before Labor Day, we lose everybody. Uh, we don't anticipate that happening this year, and we have a pretty deep staff. Great. Uh, Ms. Boy, one question. On item eight, uh, for item six and seven, those were going to, that, that was replacement. Those were replacing existing uh, machines. Is eight um, replacement as well, or is that? No, eight is, an, eight is a new machine. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Any update on the fields? We have, a meeting. we have a meeting tomorrow morning with our field consultant. Uh, he's going to be over at St. Paul's at about 8.30. We have the results of some soil sampling that we did both at St. Paul's and at Community Park. Um, both locations were found to be extremely low pH, and so we are going to begin a process of heavy liming this fall to bring the pH up to a better level for turf growth. The grass at Community Park is coming in very nicely. Uh, that field does not get used as much as the St. Paul's fields do. And we're seeing some real good grass growth down, say that three times fast. We're seeing some good grass growth down at Community Park. And we are seeing better growth at St. Paul's. And now that the soccer program and the lacrosse programs are winding down, we will be closing off all of the small window fields directly adjacent to Stewart Avenue and one medium-sized soccer field directly north of that. We believe we can accommodate that field over at Nassau Haven we are we're hoping to keep those fields closed for a full year and really let the turf develop the little window fields can be accommodated elsewhere at st paul's that was important to us we didn't want to have to move those small kindergarten fields either to stewart manor field or somewhere else uh, it's so convenient and that's also part of the issue with the field use uh, it's convenient that it St. Paul's, you can bring your kindergarten child and have them play on the front field while your third grader plays on the backfield. If we had to move those kindergarten fields, we would have families going to two different locations. And we didn't really feel that was something we wanted to do. So we did our best to avoid that. I'd like to make one other quick announcement. I almost forgot it. Saturday morning, down at Community Park Field One, starting at around nine o'clock, is gonna be a, a, just a wonderful event. It is uh, the annual celebration of the Challenger Baseball Program. We host that about once every six or seven years. It rotates between the different communities that are involved. This is a program that was started in Garden City during my first tenure back in the early 90s. And it has grown to the point now where we are expecting two to 300 people to come down and celebrate this amazing program. If any of you are in the area, I would urge you to stop by. You will have the best time of your life and you will get smiles from these kids that would just warm your heart. So Challenger celebration at Field One Community Park Saturday morning. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, Paul, quickly, um, the, the next, uh, I think uh, the date was set for the next Recreation Commission meeting. There will be a Recreation Commission meeting Tuesday, June 20th, 7.30 p.m., 
at the swimming pool in the indoor dining area up by the snack bar. Tuesday at 7.30. We should probably push that out because I know we get a lot of recreation questions. So we'll try and get that out um, you know, on social media and the website so people are aware and people to come. They get to see the pool too. Absolutely. That's why we meet there on, on the June meeting is always at the pool. Great. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Jackson. Thank you, Mayor. I do not have anything on the agenda. Just like to give the monthly statistic report for May. Uh, we responded to a total incidence of 1,808. Of that, we had 20 arrests, 74 case investigations, 14 vehicle impounds, 122 medical service calls, and 85 auto accidents. We also issued uh, 2,119 parking tickets, 1,114 traffic tickets, and nine appearance tickets. That's all I have. <laughs> That's all I have. We're a very busy department. Good. That's what we want to hear. Um, Commissioner Jackson, we had the Belmont on Friday. How, well, from your, I mean, I think everyone had a good time. I know there was a lot of concern for the board as well as other residents about the situation, kind of how it devolved last year a bit. What was your take on the, on the, on the evening? Overall, I think it went well, um, well attended. Uh, we had some minor issues with the children, not as much as we had in the past. Um, I I talked to Mr. Wilton and maybe we can come up with in the future um, more activities for the children. Uh, we lost the Islanders and we lost the, uh, the lacrosse stuff. And that was really helpful. Uh, but we were, um, with, we're in uh, communication. We, uh, we're we going to make a couple of changes in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we put the, the bike use was very low. Uh, we had uh, DPW helped us out with, immensely with their new sign machine. And um, so uh, well, we did some issues at the end of the night. And um, but uh, under most circumstances, was everything was under control. And thank you, Commissioner. Uh, your men came down, you know, late in the evening when we had about 100 kids congregating around Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, they got them to disperse. So I appreciate the going down. Yeah, at the end, there were uh, several locations we had to disperse them. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, Chief Fern. Good evening, Mayor, trustees. The fire department has nothing on the formal agenda. However, since we're not going to be meeting till after the July 4th holiday, I'd like to just provide some safety tips for the residents. Um, fireworks account for um, over 19,000 fires annually. So please, we urge all residents, take care. Do not utilize fireworks at the home. Please go to a show, whether it's thrown by the county, a private show. Please do not utilize fireworks or sparklers in the home. Um, for those of you who think sparklers may not cause a lot of damage, um, the highest uh, age range of injuries suffered through burns are for children 10 to 14, predominantly through sparklers. So please do not uh, utilize fireworks over the holiday weekend. Please go to a show. Uh, if you need to you know, have the kids do something at home, please use glow sticks, please use noisemakers, but please do not utilize fireworks at the home. Other than that, I'll be happy to take any questions anyone may have. Thank you. The comment I have is that the mayor, the fire commissioner, and myself were at uh, Adelphi University. And part of the program that they had, which I did not know about, which I'm trying to pass on to you and all of the junior firefighters who have interest, is that there is a tuition reduction for those members who are in emergency services that attend the university. So if that is of interest to any of your personnel or personnel to be that is just information that you should pass on to them we absolutely will thank you 25 percent 25 percent reduction right great it's for that police officers well. as well and yes. uh volunteer firefighters absolutely wow it's a good program <clears throat> all right thank you um mr fishberg yes uh, thank you mayor i have nothing on the formal agenda but I just want to update you on two items that we're working on. Um, the There's a license agreement for 1300 Franklin Avenue for the maintenance of the portico on that building. That license agreement expired. It was a 10 year, I think, well, no, more than that, maybe a 20 year license agreement. 
It expired on May 15 of this year. We've been working with the managing agent, and I recently had a conversation with uh, one of the um, owners of the property, I believe, and trying to work out some issue involving um, a, a deposit that nobody can locate, the deposit that may have been given uh, to ensure the terms of that agreement. As far as we know, that deposit is not being held by the village, so we're trying to work that out. Uh, also, the current uh, Verizon cable TV franchise expired about five years ago. Under PSC rules, that agreement continues on, um, and um, it has continued on. Uh, there was um, some a contact with Verizon a couple of years ago to um, renew that agreement. Uh, that somehow fell by the wayside, and I have now re-engaged Verizon uh, so that we may um, move forward to um, enter into a renewal agreement. And just um, uh, together with that, um, Cablevision's agreement expires in, um, I think, in two or three years. The Cablevision has already notified the village that they would like to talk about a renewal. So we'll be working on that as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your work on that and to Trustee Marciano and Finneran who will be helping you with that. Yes. All right, Mr. Swazi. Good evening, Mayor, Trustees, members of the public. Uh, Mayor, just two quick items. Um, on the human resources item four, uh, board, board authorizations requested for the village to adopt an updated uh, sexual harassment policy in April, New York State updated their uh, policy. Uh, it's, they call this uh, sexual harassment prevention model policy and training requirements. They basically, uh, I believe, uh, modify the language and guidance on uh, gender identification. Um, anyway, that's uh, our labor council has reviewed it and our, our updates will uh, be approved it and it'll be compliant. I want to thank Courtney Rosenblatt for keeping us in compliance on issues like this. Very important. Item number five, we just want to adopt uh, amended part-time and seasonal salary, salary schedule. We included some um, uh, part-time expenditures in the 2023-24 budget we're now operating under, but we need to modify the salary schedule to represent those positions. That's that's all I have there. Um, we already talked quickly about the H from expenditures earlier, and I'll I'll try to get something to the board before the July 20th meeting. We discuss it publicly uh, at that time. And Mayor, you'd ask about the C-Click Fix Portal. Um, if, if for those people who go to the village website on the bottom left to so where the buttons are, there's report of concern. Rather than try to find the right phone number and get bounced around in the village hall, uh, it's a really quick, easy way to report a pothole, a down branch, a light that's out. Um, the mayor had asked me to review it. Mr. Brony and I started that process. We're not completed yet. We're reviewing to make sure all the uh, the destinations of the uh, issues find the right person. Uh, we're also looking to expand maybe the categories because some of the categories that we respond to aren't listed there. So they go to the wrong place and that, that provides an opportunity for it to get lost or mishandled. So we're reviewing that. But, uh, and once we, I think we've done our review, we'll report back to the board and we'll try to uh, promote it more uh, publicly through the website, through the mayor's comics. I think. Thank you for that. And um, I just want to re repeat what Paul said. I went down the pool yesterday. I finally got down. There was a rainy day, but it looks absolutely fantastic. And I really want to compliment the job that DPW did. That uh, deck by the concession area has been uh, aesthetically unpleasing. It's been trip hazard, uh, multiple repairs that barely make it through the season. They ground it down and put a nice uh, coating on it. it. It looks very nice, and it's nice and safe. And uh, I want to compliment them. So thank them, John. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. I will actually take this chance, as you mentioned, the C click fix um, to invite residents who are, we are working on the website. Um, and if you are experiencing finding it difficult, please share your input with me because it's really helpful. Um, pass it along. We're working on, we did get input that C click fix had some glitches as well as the signing up for alerts was. You know, the button on that was sending you not to the ideal place. So um, we're trying to identify things to make it more user-friendly. And I welcome any user input. 
May or may I just make one clarification on the extended sick? It's you, the memo that you received originally, it was two employees. One employee from the recreation department has returned. So the extended sick benefit is only for one employee, DPM. Okay. Any other questions, from the trustees? I had one more question I forgot to ask Paul. Um, senior center, the floor, fixed? Yes. Great. Today, Bell yeah. 4, Bell 4 and uh, Preferred Construction were both on site today. Um, we had a meeting with them last Friday. Yeah. Because uh, we, we had a resident, we had a resident here who might have been giving the. And they were there this, today. They were there this morning. Okay. And they performed the work on the hallway. They removed the flooring and cut a quarter inch away from each side. I had a phone call to my office at about 3.30 that the floor had settled down and is looking 100% better. I did not get there this afternoon. I will go there tomorrow morning. Uh, if anything is not as well fixed as it should be, we will get right back to Belfort and Preferred and they will, they will come back in. They were both there at the same time, so they couldn't point fingers at each other, which uh, they had been doing very nicely up until about a week ago. Okay. And they both showed up on Friday morning. We had a very positive conference. Um, we let one person speak and give his opinion on exactly what should be done. And then we turned to the other person and we said, how does that sound to you? And he said, that's exactly what I would do. So they were both on the same page. And then they kind of had a, a meeting of the minds and they decided they would both send a crew in and work on it jointly. And that's what happened this morning. Can I just clarify when Mr. Blake says we had a meeting last week? Mr. Blake was there, Mr. Jamel was there, Mr. Brony was there, one of his engineers was there, his two engineer interns were there, and I was there, along with Bell. So they knew uh, we outnumbered them quite well. Uh, and and I want to just compliment Bell for, uh, again, these guys, uh, I don't think they caused the problem, but they certainly helped resolve it, and they would not walk away too satisfied. They they stood by our work, their work, and they stood by the work of the other contractor. They really... Uh, and they were both there today. So, so I just want to compliment Bell for a lot. Glad to hear that's Thank resolved. You. We'll be returning for our next meet and greet at the senior center on the 20, June 28th. So hopefully it'll be a nice smooth walk down the hallway. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, do we have citizen comments? on agenda items. Anyone in the room with a citizen comment on agenda items? Anyone on Zoom with a citizen comment on agenda items? Okay. And uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes for the June 1st, 2023 meeting? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we'll move now to the formal calendar and we'll begin with uh, Creighton Manning's presentation on the results of the satellite study. Welcome, Mr. Amavale. Thanks very much. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, trustees, village staff, um, residents, especially any of the residents here who may have been involved in the community advisory committee. So I'm I'm um, uh, I'm happy. So my name is Michael Amabile. Um, I'm a principal planner and project manager with Creighton Manning um, Consulting Engineering Transportation Planning Firm that's been in existence for um, over 50 years and uh, has been working with the village um, roughly for the last four years on a variety of different projects focused on um, traffic calming, pedestrian safety, um, and uh, here tonight to talk about what's referred to as the satellite study or the traffic calming master plan. I have quite a few slides. I will try and go through them pretty quickly uh, to allow for, for questions. Um, we've been, been working on this um, since last September, although again, the body of work goes back a number of years. Um, so I'll give people a little bit of an overview in case they were not um, at any of the prior meetings. 
Um, but again, I will try and move through it pretty quickly to allow time for questions. So next slide, sorry. So this is um, the, the project overview in terms of um, the kind of tasks we were asked to, to perform. In some ways, traditional traffic uh, kind of transportation plan that includes a mix of uh, kind of defining study areas, uh, reviewing existing conditions, getting a, that, that mix of qualitative and quantitative input that goes into a good planning process, um, identifying treatments and solutions, um, vetting those again with, with community input and or input from, from the uh, experts within the village, um, and, uh, and then kind of bringing it all together. Next slide. So this kind of, again, shows the body of work. We Speaking of the Senior Center, that's where we were last September um, for a kickoff meeting. There were a number of meetings um, with a group called uh, the Community Advisory Committee, so a, a number of, of, of residents who uh, wanted to kind of go a step beyond and, and gather for some meetings to give feedback. Um, the consultant team then developed, uh, you know, performed research and, and analysis on data, um, went back to the, to the Community Advisory Committee with uh, proposed concepts, um, and then went back again, actually, uh, for uh, another follow-up meeting and um, kind of brought it all together um, in a draft report that was made available through the agenda, um, but will be refined after this meeting with some other kind of tweaks um, and uh, any of the feedback that, that may come, come about tonight. Next slide. So uh, just a, a piece of history. This is your, your village on a map. Um, people may be familiar with the fact that what precipitated this study was a, a study that was done um, uh, in years prior in what was called the, the Numbered Streets Study. Uh, essentially, uh, Creighton Manning had been hired by the village to conduct a study of Cathedral Avenue for a road diet. Uh, residents in the adjoining streets um, said, well, are there going to be impacts? Can you look at traffic coming in our, in our neighborhoods and in our streets? We conducted a study very focused on the village-owned streets. Um, it, about a year ago, I was here presenting on that. It was fairly well received in the village uh, and the traffic commission um, uh, kind of said, let's let's do something similar across the whole village and um, identified neighborhoods within the other three sections, um, west, estates, and east, that were prototypical, let's say, or, or kind of um, contained a collection of, of street typologies, you might say, that um, if we could figure out different treatments or different options for addressing traffic calming um, on, on those streets, they could be applicable elsewhere in the village. Um, and the, that's where the idea of the satellite came up. The, the, the work was um, kind of, or excuse me, the study areas were defined in consultation with uh, the, the police commissioner, um, the village administrator, traffic commission, and, and in many cases, or excuse me, in all cases, we looked to, to identify a school and or a park within each of those. Um, next slide. Through the start of the, this project, um, <laughs> Kind of looked back and said, well, what are really the goals here? And the goals essentially of traffic calming, but specifically for this project are to reduce the, the speed of vehicles on, on streets, uh, deter cut through traffic on these streets, make the streets safer for all users, especially children, seniors, um, and, and of course, overall, um, by achieving those above, I think you improve the quality of life. You know, people complain about the, the, the noise, um, just the overall disruption that comes about from, uh, you know, unwanted speeding and, and, and uh, cut through traffic. I'm not gonna read all this to you, but traffic calming is an actual kind of recognized piece of work by the Federal Highway Administration. And there are specific types of strategies that are used to calm traffic, to, to slow speeds, to deter cut through traffic, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just point out really quickly um, at the risk of uh, sounding like a broken record for those who've been at other meetings, stop signs, traffic signals, are not traffic calming devices. They are traffic control devices. They may have benefits for slowing traffic, um, but they, they're, you know, the, the toolkit FHWA puts out for traffic calming um, don't include stop signs or, um, or traffic signals. There's a whole bunch of other treatments um, that we'll talk about that are successful at slowing speeds and um, hopefully deterring traffic. But those are the physical infrastructure ones. Traffic calming also includes education, enforcement, things of that nature. Next slide. At a high level, you're not going to look at this. These, these are some of the, the, uh, the, the quantitative data we looked at. Vehicle volumes on streets, um, crashes, 85th percentile speed. So that is the, the speed at which um, you know, the majority of the, the cars are traveling at or below that speed. 
15% of the vehicles are traveling above that speed. Um, as you've heard the police commissioner talk, that kind of becomes the metric by which to measure if speeding exists. And then we also looked at average speeds. Next slide. But again, that's the quantitative side to be balanced with the qualitative side. And we use the tool, an app called Survey123 to collect um, all in total, uh, almost a thousand points um, within the village where, where residents were able to drop pins um, and, and kind of leave a comment. There's really bad speeding on the street, or I, there's always you know crashes on the street, or people ignore stop signs on the street, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of helped us um, you know, understand where the, the numbers from, from data collection overlapped with the qualitative observations from residents. Next slide. We had already presented a, through the numbered street study, the, this is the toolkit of sorts um, uh, from the uh, FHWA traffic calming toolkit or ePrimer on different treatments. So crosswalks, uh, excuse me, raised crosswalks, speed humps, bump outs, all of these different things, they, they serve to slow traffic by either creating horizontal or vertical um, um, elements that just naturally um, cause drivers to slow down. And these were, while well, we talked about a bunch of different ones, the ones that are kind of highlighted here are the ones that the Community Advisory Committee, the Village, um, and our own kind of expertise thought would be best or most applicable here in the Village. Next slide. Here's one example. So what we provided was a little bit more background on each of these treatments, and then also conducted um, a, a suitability analysis around your streets using traffic volumes, lane width, some other criteria to say where, you know, just looking at, at a high level, um, based on the, the criteria of the streets, which treatments would be suitable. Now, that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be feasible or they're going to be welcomed by the public, but are they suitable? Are the volumes kind of within the right range? Are the lane widths within the right range? Are there other kind of design elements on those streets that would make different treatments suitable? Um, we conducted that on uh, all village streets. Next slide. And again, the, the criteria that we used were informed by um, for the suitability, we're informed by guidance from FHWA, from the Institute for um, uh, Traffic Engineers, Transportation Engineers, excuse me, uh, and other guidelines um, to, to say, all right, you don't want to put the, this type of treatment on a street if the volumes are really basically we tried to use thresholds of minimums, um, or excuse me, maximums. If the volumes are above a certain amount, you, you probably don't want to be putting them there because they could serve to, to slow traffic to such a great degree it could have negative repercussions on the kind of overall network operations. So, you know, causing congestion in certain ways. Um, but we use these as, again, a first pass to kind of identify um, the suitability of different treatments. And we did this for um, a number of different uh, treatments. So speed humps, chicanes, these chokers or bump outs, um, neighborhood traffic circles, which we'll talk about a little later. Next slide. Um, so after we've done that analysis, we looked at the maps. We looked at some of the survey one, two, three feedback. We talked about it with the traffic commission. We went to the CACs and we, we said, okay, these are the um, you know, 10, 20 actually or so locations without the throughout the village. So we, we looked at basically two to three locations within each of those satellites, the two satellites in the West, the two satellites in Estates and the two satellite and the three satellites, excuse me, in the East. We looked for about two or three different locations um, in each of those and kind of came up with an idea and presented those to the traffic commission and to the CACs at the, the second CAC meeting. Next slide. And this is what they were. And I'll just be frank, it was a really great process and it's how planning processes are supposed to go. Some of the ideas were really well received. Some of the locations were really well received. In some cases, neither the idea or the location was well received. And that's that's what the process is supposed to be. You're not going to you know, get them all right. And it was good that there was community uh, feedback. So certain ideas, um, you know, when we showed up, we thought this might be worth trying. And they said, people said, that's not going to work there, or we don't really like that, or you're not going to get enough support, or it, that's a great idea, but why don't you try it over here a little bit? So um, we went back and sharpened our pencils, as they say. Next slide and settled on uh, this collection. Uh, now, what we're showing here, um, and I don't expect you to really be able to fully see this here, but it will be in the report, is um, you know a mix of recommendations that we feel would work, um, and those are the circles. And if they're squares, we actually sketched out concepts for them that you'll be able to see. Um, and for um, keeping in mind that prior recommendations in the numbered street study are not included in here. Those, um, which we can talk about a little bit more, some of those 
the 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 village is already acted on um and we'll we'll get to talk about that in a second when it comes to fourth street or seventh street um so to keep in mind again 25 or 30 concepts were sketched we're just going to go through a few tonight all of them will be in the final report um as I said, they're based on the high-level suitability, uh, suitability analysis, um, our professional judgment, community feedback. These are not final designs. Please keep that in mind. These are these are concepts. We're confident in them, but they obviously need to be, um, you know, discussed uh, further and and other things that the village um, will need to consider. And then um, one last thing is. Uh, so all of them, or some of them, or most of them, I should say most of them, uh, could be tested um, in a trial basis, either with temporary materials um, or kind of a, a, as a demonstration project. Um, so that's just something to consider as well. Next slide. So I will quickly go through these because um, I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, and again, all of these will be discussed in, in or presented in totality in the, um, in the final report. But working from west to east, um, we're going to just kind of talk through a few of them. So this is at the Homestead School on Stratford. What we're proposing would be um, what's called bump outs or kind of extending the curb um, to what you, in doing that here, you narrow the roadway. Um, Stratford is a very, very wide road. Um, I understand that it may seem like a very narrow road when there is a bunch of buses or cars dropping their kids off, but at other times of day, um, it's a very wide road. Um, all things considered, even after we've put the curb extensions in, you still wind up having, you know, 15, 20 um, foot lanes in some cases. Um, these curb extensions could probably be even a little bit wider. The point is that you narrow the road from both sides and it makes for shorting, shorter crossing distances. And again, you get that narrowing impact um, that visually forces drivers to slow down. And again, throughout the process, we looked at things like parks and schools, um, to focus some of these concept treatments. Next slide. Tanner's Pond Road was uh, also Tanner's Pond winds up being um, uh, is a border right between two sections. So um, I think we talk about it here in the West, but a few slides later, there's ideas and we, we give those to the states. So um, Tanner's Pond came up regularly um, in the survey one, two, three and the CACs from the traffic commission themselves. This is one of actually three, maybe four different concepts we had sketched here. Uh, to, again, narrow the roadway. Um, one of the things we heard is, oh, you have people flying across New Market and, and then kind of zipping up into Fenimore. We definitely heard lots about people flying up and down Tanner's Pond um, to, to head north. Narrowing the roadway slows traffic down. Also, in these cases, um, when you kind of extend the curbs around like that, it'll also force people to turn slower. So let's say, for example, you, you have a car going fast, south on Tanner's Pond Road, wanting to whip into New Market um, by extending the curbs here, they would uh, and should be slowing down on those turns. Next slide. So one of the things that actually the traffic commission was talking about um, uh, in the, just before is the importance of implementing traffic calming in networks or systems. So the benefit of, of speed hump um, can be measured if you just have one. So let's say for example, uh, between Edgemere and Middletown, just to have the one on Princeton, there would be a benefit. Um, you'll get way more benefit if you have one or two or three on Princeton and one or two on Harvard um, kind of spread throughout. It A, it, it prevents the like speed to slow down to speed um, kind of scenario, because if you keep doing that, then you really are going to just moderate your speed and just go through it at 20 miles an hour, as opposed to 35 down to 15, 35 down to 15. Um, and the second is, uh, this is one way to kind of mitigate against the whole um, cut through thing of, well, now they put this traffic common treatment here. So I'm just gonna pivot up to Harvard. If you're not actually intending to be on, on any of these streets, you don't live here, you're not visiting people here and you're just using it as a cut through. And uh, this is where traffic common is supposed to act as a deterrent and keep traffic on Edgemere or New Hyde Park Road, which is, the roads that are intended for, you know, ca carrying uh, those volumes of traffic. Next slide. So again, here's Tanner's Pond Road, um, and this could be a complement to what was proposed at back at the New Market intersection, which would be um, in that run from New Market north to the to the to the bridge um, to to further calm traffic. Next slide. 
one of the treatments that is um, uh, can be successful in kind of the reverse of, of extending the curbs is narrowing the lanes by introducing a, a median. Um, there's a variety of different design styles for the medians, both in terms of like landscape, their hardscape, but also in terms of whether they're a continuous median or they're kind of intermittent or broken. Um, currently, they're roughly 15 foot lanes. We repeatedly heard in the survey one, two, three, um, that South Avenue between New Hyde Park Road and Adelphi and all the cut through that was happening on these streets as well as other ones, um, that South Avenue became a, a is a bit of an issue. So this is one approach. Um, speed humps, the, the volumes are, are kind of high and, and kind of right near the threshold, the, the traffic volumes are kind of high right near the threshold where we, you may not want to necessarily do speed humps, um, especially as you get closer to New Hyde Park Road because it could actually wind up having some congestion impacts. But um, this is one approach and I, I would certainly would, would encourage the village to um, to seriously explore this given the, the, the feedback, the repeated feedback about South Avenue. Next slide. Um, and then as a complement to that, so this is just to the south of South Avenue, right? Um, that uh, again, lots of comments from the survey one, two, three of excessive speeding on, um, on these streets, Brompton and um, Whitehall, et cetera. So um, again, this is uh, the idea of this, we think that this would be a great neighborhood to implement a, a, a network or a series of speed humps. And I'll just take a, a moment here to talk about um, the speed humps regularly implemented on streets with, with stop signs or without, um, and always placed though at a distance set back from stop signs and at a distance set back from driveways. So um, just that's something to, to be aware of that, they, that those, um, there are kind of citing guidelines that we've worked out with the village um, for the example on 4th Street. Next slide. Weatherall, uh, repeatedly again, also, also another street that came up. Um, and this is an example where it was next to a, a park. Again, many of the treatments or concept sketches located near parks or schools. We hear a lot about Weatherall as a cut through from old country. Um, these bump out treatments, they shorten the crossing distances, they narrow the lanes, they really kind of create that, that that neck down treatment that narrows the roadways and forces drivers to slow down. Um, and in this case, could do it at those two and the third. Um, I think one of these locations just also came up tonight for new stop signs. Um, so next slide. So this is, um, I recognize that this, this treatment may seem a little kind of um, different than some of the other things that people may have seen because to this point, everything I've talked about, you've all seen either on your own streets in the village or not that far from your, your streets in, in, in other villages or certainly in, in some larger municipalities, New York City, et cetera. Neighborhood traffic circles are not roundabouts. They're not rotaries. Um, they are, again, from the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration's toolkit of traffic calming. They, are, uh, they, they force drivers to slow down, not only while they're entering the, the intersection, but as they kind of navigate through it and they're turning out of it. So um, you have actually a number of intersections in the village that we think that these could work at. This was, again, we were trying to go to places where we heard repeatedly um, issues and whether all, um, again, for that cut through traffic from old country, this is one idea um, for this intersection and would be a complement to what's then further south. Um, but again, this is a, a case where you have um, a few different ways to, to handle this hardscaping or landscaping. You can't have anything too high in the middle, but um, you, you can landscape it. They can look nice. Uh, I do have some photos later on in the presentation. If you want, we can show that they look okay. Next slide. Now over to the, again, in the east, but then further south, we um, heard a lot about Chestnut, actually both on both sides of Clinton. Um, that there's you know speeding uh, into Clinton. This is on the um, this is on the east side of Clinton, um, and there was uh, numerous comments around speeding near Tremont and Boylston. Uh, we would recommend a series of speed humps on those streets from Meadow, Chestnut, Poplar, etc. Um, again, for that same kind of network proposal. Next slide. And then this is a raised crosswalk. So at 
Stratford, excuse me, at, <clears throat> at Homestead, we were proposing curb um, extensions or bump outs integrated into the uh, crosswalks. This would be um, a raised crosswalk. So it's almost essentially like a speed hump and a crosswalk put together. And this same treatment was proposed at um, uh, another school as well. I'm drawing a blank on right now. Um, but the idea um, is that it's a speed hump. You are elevating the roadway, also then kind of elevating the visibility of pedestrians when they're using that crosswalk um, and forcing drivers to slow down. Next slide. Okay, so obviously what you just saw there, all those sketches are actual concrete, so to speak, treatments. But um, there are some other things that we discussed with the traffic commission that are gonna be part of the, the overall kind of recommendation or ideas for consideration. Again, these are recommendations or ideas for consideration. These are not anything set in stone yet. But <clears throat> one of the things that was discussed, we did some research on, the village was very interested and asked us to look into further was you know, what mechanisms exist for, by which residents can request traffic calming treatments um, as a way to help inform the traffic commission about making decisions. The numbers can say one thing, but is it also worth it to, to find out if there's a way to let residents kind of call for certain treatments and or weigh in on certain treatments? And I know that the, the village um, has, you know, engaged with um, with residents when, when exploring things like the speed humps on 4th Street um, or, or other locations. And to kind of codify this um, is one of the things that's included in the overall traffic calming master plan. Um, what would be a request protocol for installation of either a temporary or a permanent treatment, as well as for the removal of it, right? So the village is going to spend time and money putting a treatment in, and then a few weeks or months later, residents are like, well, actually, we don't really want this. Well, <laughs> it doesn't really work. <laughs> it shouldn't work that way. Um, and just one quick story from the from the meeting, um, we noticed in our research that a lot of municipalities would use a certain threshold, a percentage, right? X number of residents, you know, on the street or in the area have to be in support of it. And um, it was a really kind of great moment. It was like, well, how would you set? Should it be 75? Should it be 85? Should it be 50? What should it be? And um, uh, one of the members of the CAC was like, well, it's on the books that in order to have a, a block party, you have to get 75% of your residents here in the village. Um, to support it. I was like, well, that seems like a good threshold. If it's, if it's good enough for a block party, it should be good enough for a speed hump. So um, yeah, that's not set in stone again, but, but kind of those types of, uh, of ideas, I think, are, illustrate the, um, the engaged community you have and, and, and the great ideas that we got through this process. Um, some of the other ideas for, for consideration would be, okay, so there's lots of streets in the village. Lots of people are going to be asking for certain things. How do you prioritize which ones to act upon? Um, are there ways also to kind of leverage existing capital plans or future capital plans to help prioritize things? So for example, when the village has mill and, you know, mill and fill or mill and pave contracts coming up, those might make sense to review some of those streets to see if any of them have been identified for, for speed homes. Uh, again, beyond um, concrete things, uh, the village is also already exploring and I know has been discussing the idea of speed limit reduction or automated enforcement like red light and speed cameras, not all of which they have sole control over. I should say the speed limit reduction, the state has passed a law enabling villages to explore that and potentially lower speed limits from 30 to 25 miles an hour. The automatic enforcement thing, I think is a little, still a little more complicated, but nonetheless, I think something that the, uh, would be a, a great complement to some of these other traffic calming initiatives. And then the last thing that's included is the, the use of temporary treatments um, whether that's for speed humps, like we'll talk about in a minute on 4th Street, or bump outs, neck downs, even traffic circles with, um, with uh, flexible delineators, um, retroflective tape, and other materials, you can, inst you can install these treatments in a temporary manner um, and then study whether, you know, whether or not they're effective. Next slide. So quick final piece um, the, that I think is relevant because well, not just because it, it, it came out of the numbered street study, but I think if uh, there are any, any skeptics in the crowd about speed humps, but this is a, a, a great story right here from, from your village that speed humps were implemented on 4th Street. The Traffic Commission took on that initiative, uh, worked with residents um, and um, uh, the village engineer and his, his, his crew put these in. Uh, and then the village asked us to conduct a study. Next slide. And the results were, were overwhelming. Um, so this is um, the first 
kind of set of data is around average speeds eastbound and westbound on 4th Street. And again, this is 4th Street from Franklin to Hilton. Um, average speeds, then again, that 85th percentile speed. So kind of think of it as, you know, most people are going at or below that speed. That's the target speed that you really want to try and lower. And then um, the percentage of people going above the speed limit. Uh, and, but I think that middle one is, is really kind of uh, the, the most astounding that the, the data before shows that, um, you know, the, the 35th percent, the 85th percentile speed, excuse me, was, was almost 40 miles an hour. Um, and that after it was down to, to 29 or roughly on average 29 miles an hour. So pretty, pretty overwhelming, plus lots of positive feedback from um, the residents, school, church, et cetera. Next slide. So um, the next steps is all of this is again, wrapped up into a final report um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the village to consider. Um, and uh, it, some other actions could be to act upon, you know, certain proposals that are already existing or develop this capital program to identify other, other locations, um, define those protocols and potentially implement these um, study treatments. And all of this again, will be summarized in a final report. Next slide, so that's it. It was a little longer than I intended, I apologize. It's excellent, thank you. Thank you Mike. Good. Any questions from the trustee? Starting off with, um, during your study, were you able to come to any conclusion with regard to what I would call the saturation of some of the north-south or east-west roads? Saturation meaning the, the, the usage of them? Yes. So- One of which it would be Stewart Avenue going into West mm -hmm. towards Cherry Valley Avenue. And that, of course, then is the North South, mm -hmm. which backs up from there almost a quarter to a half mile. Um, You're, uh, I'll, the answer is traffic operations is, was not part of the study. So, okay. yeah. It's a little disappointing, but honest that, that we didn't look at traffic operations or modeling of kind of movement overall. I think the focus is, I don't think, the focus was uh, how do we get the vehicles that are traveling on those roads to travel slower and or deter ones who shouldn't be on those streets from using them. But as they go slower, mm -hmm. if you have the same volume, the likelihood is that you're going to back well, up. That's that's exactly my point about that certain streets, you'd look at what the existing volumes are. And if they're the AADT, so the average annual daily traffic is above a certain threshold, then we probably wouldn't recommend certain treatments that might slow them to a point where you'd start to have those knock on impacts. So the next question, because I ask questions for a living. I try and answer them. Is to what extent and the reason why I ask it is if there is the potential for the casino to going in, how would that add to the volume to the village that we would have to take a look at mm -hmm. again, um, the congestion that it will occur, and can we quantify that? That's that's way beyond the study that we we perform, but a, but someone could perform a study. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that they're already that they must be. Mm -hmm. Pretty extensive traffic analysis around to make the case for the casino, right? You guys, <laughs> I, I'm sure you're looking. I'm sure you're looking at it from your own perspective about how do you, you know, questioning those numbers. But that was not part of this study. Thank you. But it could be part of another study. Could be part of a study. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there has been much of a traffic study that's okay. been part of the big problem at the casino. Um, you mentioned Edgemere. One of the things in Edgemere, and the mayor probably knows this well, is that curve. They come down and they go underneath the railroad, and there's been a number of bad accidents there. Um, did you look at that at all? Or, or so, you... sorry, do you mind just going back to the the map? I I think um the let's see the improvement sketches map um right at the beginning. Yeah, just keep going. Two or three more uh, back, then <laughs> one more. Okay, so you're talking um, where the purple dot, north of the purple dots, correct? I can't really see the purple. Uh -huh. Let me see it. Let me get back to that. 
It'll be under the trestle. Yeah. No, the other one, the other train tracks. It's heading north on Edgemere, more or less, going down that curve past the park and underneath the railroad. The one curve there. Yeah, we, we looked exclusively at the section that's adjacent to that blue box there um, along the golf course. And um, the concept that was proposed there would be similar to what was proposed along south. So the narrowing of the roadway with a center median. Um, but we didn't look closer to the trestle, any any treatment right at the at that location. So, so you're talking about narrowing the road and then putting a median in? So there? the same design that was, I mean, it, it was it was one concept that was looked at because again, the volumes on Edgemere kind of pushed a little bit higher than we'd feel comfortable recommending speed humps on. Now, again, the, the, those recommendations uh, from FHWA and ITE, they are their guidelines. They are not a concrete rule. Like you can never put a speed hump on a road with more than 7,000 vehicles as your AADT. In fact, in some cases, if you were in like a commercial neighborhood, you could almost make the case that it would be even better because you really, really, really want to slow speeds down there, right? Um, but in that case, um, we didn't think th we didn't think speed humps would be advisable. Yeah, not on that road. I guess more of a track of traffic device. I guess might be more appropriate. Yeah, but it's possible that a reevaluation of Edgemere Road might lead to the possibility of speed humps. It's not foreclosed on Edgemere. That was my understanding of where we were on that. Yes, our recommendations were based on certain thresholds. We could talk through it. I think what we would want to do is we'd want to look a little bit closer at, you know, um, what the, you know, what times of day the, the volumes are, are, are at their greatest. Um, and, you know, the other thing could be if, if, the, if the center median idea isn't um, kind of, people aren't receptive to it, there's also the idea of the uh, median islands. So the splitter islands, that, that treatment that we had sketched at one point on Tanner's Pond, that a series of those could kind of give you that narrowing impact as you came to the intersections. So there, there's still a lot that could be explored on both um, on Edgemere and on Tanner's Pond. Thank you. Any other questions from the trustees? Any other, any questions from, I've asked all my, many a question. Mr. Alardi. Hi, Steve Alardi, 139 Meadow. Um, on Edgemere, I would, I would think that's probably a main road that the fire department would use, and I'm not sure how speed humps would go with, with that. But um, my question in regards to the the two green square boxes on Meadow Street, um, there is a paving project on the schedule for that area. And if they're going to move the temporary humps on fourth someplace, that might be a location to put the temporary ones to see how they perform. So if you're going to do a permanent one, it could be put into the road project that's on the schedule for later this year. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. Mr. Gray. Steve Gray, 44 Cambridge. I vehemently oppose any kind of median on Edgemere. I live on Cambridge. I don't know where you would put it. It's a narrow street as it is. On one side are sidewalks, on the other side is a narrow strip which goes against the fence of the golf course. I don't know how you can do it safely. What I would suggest perhaps are bumps or lumps or whatever you want to call them. But my question in that regard is, if we do get snow and we don't get as much as we used to, are these things going to be safe? Are they going to be visible in rain? Are they going to be visible if there's snow? What's going to happen if a plow goes over them? I think that those questions have to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. There's been a lot of discussion about both those topics. We talked at length about, it seems narrow, both Edgemere and South Avenue. A lot of discussion on that. And as was explained, they're just concepts. Um, and there was also a lot of discussion on snow plows and fire safety. Yeah, I mean, everything would be signed in a way that was appropriate, MUTCD standards. Um, so. Yeah, we, we wouldn't recommend anything that uh, wouldn't be compliant or kind of get, get the blessing of the village engineer. Great, thanks. Any other questions on 
uh, traffic, the traffic calming study, Mr. Stimler? Leo Stimler, uh, 67 Huntington Road. I'd like to follow up on Trustee Torino's uh, point about Sands Casino. Their newspaper reports that they're looking at 35 to 36 intersections in Nassau County. Um, uh, so the village, thankfully, wants to calm traffic. I don't think the Sands Casino wants the traffic. They'll want to rush it through. So I, I hope we can make sure that we know which which uh, intersections they're studying and be prepared just in case this thing goes through. Thank you. Uh, but by the way, do does the village need Nassau County's permission to do this, whatever we, whatever you vote on to improve, to do that, or do we have to get Nassau County to approve anything that, even if it's a village street? No, these are all, these are all our own tools that are on village roads, so we would not need county approval. Any other questions? Uh, Carl Russo, Six Edgemere Road. Um, I'm glad that uh, a lot of study has gone into Edgemere Road because that's been one of my biggest complaints. It's very hard for me to pull out of my driveway uh, because the traffic is, um, at different times of the day, the traffic is really horrendous. Uh, going south on Edgemere Road by Vassar, I don't think anybody really knows that there's a sign up there that says, 15, 15 miles per hour, okay? Uh, and, and, and because going south, the road narrows and it curves, okay? It curves right before it gets to my house. I've had cars up, you know, up on the curve and, uh, at different times. They even knocked down, there's another sign right on the corner of Vassar and Edgemere. They've knocked that down a couple of times too. Um, so we want to talk about putting islands in. We want to talk about doing all of these other things that with the speed that these cars are going down there is only going to create more accidents. You're going to find guys, especially if you're uh, talking about going under the railroad trestle, if you put something over there, it, it's there's going to be a lot of serious accidents. Uh, one of the other things on Edgemere Road, I mean, you've... Uh, the village has done whatever it could do to stop truck trafficking, but it doesn't always work. And there's a lot of trucks that aren't making deliveries on the streets over there. They're just cutting through. Um, like this gentleman said, you know, we want to put traffic on New Hyde Park Road and Edgemere Road because those are through the streets. Uh, but Edgemere Road does is not a, a through street street for trucks and but yet there are a lot of trucks that go that way so we we got to slow it down and i don't think uh on a road like edgemere road putting up some uh, curves and stuff is going to help I, I don't be honest with you i don't know what's going to help except maybe you know like a a, a plane lands on an aircraft carrier you know it's it, there's a there's a rope that stops it you know so maybe if a car is going 50 miles an hour, a rope comes and stops it. I mean, other than that, I have no suggestions. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions either in the room or on Zoom about the traffic coming? Report. All right, well. Thank you for a great presentation. It's been a lot of work has went into it. And thank you to everyone who's part of that. All right, so continuing the formal agenda, I have um, a, a proposed appointment of John Cantwell, 215 Kilburn, Kilburn Road, as a member of the Board of Commissioners of Cultural and Recreational Affairs for a term to expire April 5th, 2027. Um, he would be replacing, it may be a little confusing, Christian Siragusa, who you'll hear about in just a moment, whose term expired April 3rd. Is there a motion? I move to appoint John Cantwell as a member of the Board of Commissioners of Cultural and Recreational Affairs. 
I second that motion. Okay. All in favor? All opposed? That passes. Um, two. Two. All right, next I am proposing uh, Christian Siragusa of 204 Wellington Road as a member of the Board of Commissioners of Cultural and Recreational Affairs for a term to expire April 5th, 2027. This fills an at-large position that has been vacant uh, previously. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right, and I'll... Uh, Propose uh, appointing Paul Rothenbiller of 216 Kensington Road as a member of the Planning Commission for a term to expire April 6, 2026. He's replacing H. Bradford Gustafson, whose term expired April 3rd of 2023. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And um, lastly, I'm proposing uh, Jack Hartog. Uh, that he be appointed of 82 Second Street as a member of the Planning Commission for a term to expire April 6, 2026. He is replacing Scott Brandwoody, whose term expired April 3rd of 2023. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, unanimous. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Uh, Something yeah. maybe just for full transparency, there's two items that weren't discussed on the consent calendar items. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll mention number one. Number one is to engage Creighton Manning, who just made the presentation here, to establish a fund of twenty five thousand to pay their hourly rates uh, in association with implementing these studies: the Cathedral Road, Diet Numbered Streets, and Satellite and Miscellaneous assignments. We talked at the Traffic Commission tonight about a crosswalk from First Street to Community Park, uh, which has been a gap in the pedestrian system in the village for a while. And we want to consult with Creighton Manning. Uh, the superintendent of DPW has set up a, a great sketch and an outline and a diagram. And we wanted to check with them to see if they thought that the placement of the crosswalk was at the best location for the residents of First Street. And that's an example of a miscellaneous task that would be funded out of this, this fund. So that's that's number one. And uh, Mr. Swazi, you can do number two. Actually, I can speak to number two is our um, extending for 90 days, Carissa. Gardino, who is our public relations consultant. And um, I have on here, we have a contract with her. Yes. Um, that you. is either expiring or about to, and it's to extend it for 90 days. And the purpose of extending it for 90 days is because we're doing a communication overhaul. And we just want to, I'd like to make sure everything in that contract reflects what we're going to be asking of her. So um, at the 90 days, I'm hoping we'll have a communications plan and we'll be able to make it more precise, that contract. Thank you. And, and I think having this fund for Creighton Manning will assist in the efficient implementation of some of the traffic calming devices, although I don't think we'll be using the rope idea. All right, any questions on, Good idea. on those two items? All right, do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. All right, the one last item on the agenda, Cherry Valley Club will be holding its annual fireworks display um, September 4th. I guess we hadn't talked about that. We just approved that as well. Are there any cit citizens' comments on non-agenda items? Okay, Mr. Alardi. Steve Alardi, 139 Meadow Street. Um, after the board meeting in, in May, I did discuss with you, Mayor, about the sidewalk work that has been uh, issued to the residents on Meadow Street and Grove and Lindbergh and Commander. And a lot of this work is work that was done about nine years ago when the road project was supposed to take place. 
And many of the people have many of the same sidewalk flags that they replaced last time, needing to be replaced again, mostly due to the raising by village trees. And um, I did send a follow-up email early June. I haven't seen a response to that. And I'm wondering if the village is considering looking at the work that was done nine years ago and that people are being asked to pay for again, which would never happen in the village because you only do an assessment of the sidewalks when you do a road project. And if the road was paved as scheduled at that time, and it's been delayed for various reasons, a gas main, a water main, flooding issues, um, the village would not be back assessing these same residents at this time. And uh, I'm wondering if the village or the board would consider looking at what people paid for last time and not assessing them for the same flags that are now raised by the same village trees again. All right, I do recall our conversation and I, I think what I had asked for, and I'm not sure, I, I never saw if we have the flags that were done nine years ago and are being um, repeated. So if we could get that, I'll take a look at it and we'll discuss it. Is my email received, do you know? I remember having the conversation right here. Yes, I, and I, I followed up uh, early June when I didn't, you know, just wanted to follow up on it. Yeah. And and in that email, I also said, and I will bring it up next year at the budget talks, that, you know, this is an issue every year with the residents. And for many years, it's been discussed about rolling the sidewalks into the road project only for the areas where you're doing a road project not every sidewalk in the village, but when you're doing the street, and I understand the aprons and curbs are part of the road project, to move another four or five feet in and, and cover the sidewalks. And I, I don't think the residents would be that inconvenienced by whatever that tax increase would be. It's a $500,000 sidewalk reimbursement from the residents. If that's lumped into the budget, and people are paying an extra $25 a year in their taxes, instead of getting a, a $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 bill that says you have 30 days to comply, you know, people don't have that money sitting around to do. Okay, and so I, that's a, I, I understand that issue. I did get that email, but on the narrower issue, we'll take a look at the homes that got repeat flags because the road work wasn't done. So thank you. All right. Uh, any other citizen comments on non-agenda, Monica? Okay. I have comments on two things. And who are, they're who are you, please? Hmm? Who are you, please? Oh. Uh, Monica Kiley, 95 Huntington Road. So um, I want to talk about the say no to the casino effort and um, where you all may probably know by now that the Nassau County Legislature has voted to transfer the lease to the Sands Corporation. And um, our grassroots group is trying to get the word out that this is only the first step. Although it's a disappointing setback, it's only the first step in a very long process. And our next goal is to try and educate the public. So I sent you all on the board a graphic. Um, it's not say no to the casino. It's an educational graphic that kind of lays the process out in an easy to digest format that kind of gives it to you at a glance. And I had asked in my email if that could be posted on our website. I know we're working on the website and on communication, and I'm wondering if we could have space on the website to educate our residents about this process. Um, you know, it affects them. Um, and maybe we could set up some guidelines as to what's educational and what's maybe a little too far along the spectrum of telling people how to think or what to do. You know, maybe it could just be educational if it has to be that. Um, but just wanted to put that out there to you guys. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know. If we haven't discussed putting it. I don't see the harm in an educational, you know, letting people, re residents know what the process is. My so. opinion is that the village needs to have a repository 
to be used and accessed by the residents in order that they can inform themselves because a grassroots movement uh, is like the game of telephone in which one person talks to the next, to the next. And by the time you get to the last person, nobody knows what the first question is. Right. And there should be a source that everybody can go to. It shouldn't be an email chain. I agree with you that uh, similar to other things that were done in the village in which we have a repository for information, of course, it then would get submitted to the village to be vetted before it is placed up. But I Understood. would be in favor of that. Well, if I may, the problem with that is if you allow one group to utilize the website in that fashion, if somebody comes in who's pro-casino, you might have to let them use it as well. I would not object to that because then you basically have a situation where the individuals who are reading it get to vet it to find out how real it is or is not. Similar to what you see in Newsday. I mean, you have different versions of what reality is, each of the individuals who reads it should have the ability to make their own mind up. I would agree with tr uh, Trustee Torino on that. And uh, Monica's point, this would really just be educating the residents as to the process of the casino on the website. Right. If we do that, Gary would be staying away from the issue of yeah. Yeah. Not taking a position. Um, I mean, the, I thought of the casino when I looked at the chart and saw the most pins dropped in the eastern section of Garden City. This is like a really, um, this could be a tremendous impact on the village and people should know what the process is and what they can do mm -hmm. to have their, you know, to oppose it. If it's a matter of outlining the process, explaining uh, what the steps are uh, for approval, that's probably okay, uh, as opposed to... Uh, uh, the advocacy of uh, right gary i should have sent you the graphic but oh, okay. it's, we'll it's, share it. it's factual it's not it's no opinions it's just educational um you know i don't know if you all have the experience of getting mailers from the county uh and the town of hempstead about things like um senior beach passes at lido beach and just kind of you know, the county and the town have been nowhere on informing, and that's by design. That that's why we're everybody's in the dark as to what's going on, is because our government is not giving us any information. Um, so we have to educate ourselves, sadly. Thank you. I, um, I agree. I think we're all in agreement with getting that information shared on the process so people are aware of what's going on, because as you point out, they're not getting it other places. Right. And now to my second, um, and this is more towards the lobbying and uh, persuasive effort. Um, many of you have seen the say no to the casino lawn signs around the village. They've been very effective in, you know, bringing like-minded people together and, you know, getting our grassroots movement going. Uh, sadly, there's been a pattern of theft of the signs. Two of three of them were stolen on Huntington Road, one on the corner of Wyatt and Westbury, two on Tremont, at least two that I know of on Locust, um, two on the corner of Washington and Chestnut, two on the corner of Stewart and Roxbury. And those are just the anecdotal ones that I know about. I've been asking the residents who have reported their signs stolen to me to check their ring camera footage and also to please report this to the police. Commissioner Jackson, has anyone reported their sign being stolen? Okay, uh, one of the residents has ring uh, camera footage of a young man, lanky, tall young man, driving up in a car, very purposeful, pulling up in front of the house, getting out of the car, nabbing the sign, putting it in the trunk and driving away. Not a group of teenagers coming down the block, somebody very purposefully stealing the sign. And a number of them seem to be clustered around the southeast section of town. Sadly, the one that may be impacted the most by um, traffic, but that's just a little piece of irony. So, um, you know, I, I 
want to make you aware that this is going on. And, um, you know, I, I hope that uh, people do take the time to report their lawn sign stolen. And, and I hope it's taken seriously by the village. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Um, Commissioner, if you can look into that, find out what footage we've gotten, how many reports we've gotten, and maybe report to us, you know, send us an email and update us on that. Uh, yes, Mayor. I'm not aware of any uh, reports, but uh, uh, we usually take case reports, but if anybody has footage, uh, we'll be glad to look at it and see if we can find who the culprits are. I do think people are hesitant to my sister's sign was stolen too on garden one of not mentioned. I think people are like, oh, I don't want to bother this the police, but it, it seems to be rampant and we're being targeted here, I think, and it's related to the casino. So I do think it's it is a loss any report if it's on your private property. So if somebody takes it, we'll we'll take a report if they wish. Okay. All right. So if you can keep track and we'll see what we can do on that. Thank you. Yep. If somebody uh, also uh, gets a license plate, that would help us. <laughs> Any other citizen comments on non-agenda items? Anyone on Zoom with a comment on a non-agenda item? All right. So that concludes our meeting. We are not going to adjourn. We are going into an executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Um, and we will close the meeting after our executive session. Make a motion that we close the meeting? No, no. Okay. That we go into executive session. But I have to close the meeting and no, then go. We, can't. No. we don't close the meeting? Oh, okay. Bruce, you want to make it? Make a motion that we adjourn to executive session.